on the issue of mental health in sports, it's going to be an issue that uh, not talked about a lot up until recent times, and we're happy that it is, and it's something we thought we should deal with this year, and our student leaders were very emphatic about including this topic in our symposium. So here we are. Our guests include Sharon Masling from Morgan Lewis. I always appreciate Morgan Lewis being with us. Ari Miller from Vermont, but now Johns Hopkins, right? A lot of background in dealing with mental health and performance. Dr. Alfie, that's what I'm told to call her. Uh, Dr. Alfie uh, of the Acoma Project. She's a mental health whiz that has been all over social media. I follow her, you should too. Um, and we'll talk about her project with Lady Gaga as well. And the man who needs no introduction, Brian Westbrook, who's had a little bit of a career here in football. And uh, it's great to sort of again, start Final Four weekend with someone like Brian. Go Cats, right Brian? And joining me is another one of my star students, Danny Bland, to co-moderate. Let's welcome everyone. And Brian, I'll start with you because I just mentioned it. This is something that didn't get a lot of attention years ago and probably when you were playing. Uh, and certainly when you were playing as a college athlete here at Villanova. Now it's a little bit more mainstream. People are talking about it. We have Dr. Alfie out there. We have mental health performance at colleges. That's good, right? And you're seeing this from a different perspective than when you played. Well, you know, first of all, thank you so much for, for allowing me to be here. Um, it is totally different. Now, I graduated from Villanova in 2001, which I don't know how many, how many years is that? 21 years. That's a long time ago now. You're still a baby. So these gray, these gray hairs are earned. Um, you know, so when I, when I go back to college and think about what was mental health at the time, it, there really wasn't. Back in the day, it was your job is to go play sports. And no matter if you're healthy physically or mentally healthy, your job was to go out there and play sports. And if you didn't go and do your job, then we'll just go find somebody else to take your job. And so there was never a consideration of, especially back then, of what is best for you mentally or quite honestly, physically. And you know, physically was a little bit more, they were more concerned with coaches and um, other players were a little bit more concerned physically because they can see you limping, right? But the mental side was the part that no one knew that you were struggling with, that no one even considered. And when you compare it to today, you know, we've come a very long way. Um, today, we have athletes that say, I need time out. I need a time away from the sport. And this is the hard part about sport. This is a hard part about, and I'll speak about the NFL and football in general. Really, it's, it's all sports, but professional sports in particular. You're getting paid to do a job, and the only thing that they're concerned with is you showing up every single day. And it's all about, what have you done for me lately? You, you had a great game last week. You had 200 yards rushing, but if this week you only had 50, that means we're talking about trying to hire somebody else to take your spot. And so that pressure, that stress, every single day to perform, every single week to perform, that just overcomes you. And at some point, you say, okay, I have to overlook injury, physical injury, as well as mental stress and injury just to go out there and perform. And in the NFL, unfortunately, contracts are not guaranteed. And so as soon as you stop performing, at that point, your, your lifestyle, your, your living, your money, your bank account, all that's in peril. And gladly today, we have athletes that are willing to say, enough is enough. I need a break. If you want me to play 17 games in a season, I need two weeks off just so I can mentally prepare for that. If you want me to play in the, the tennis championships, I don't want to be stressed out. I don't want to be all these different things. I need some time away. And I'm, I'm just glad that our athletes have finally taken a point and, and said, enough is enough. We want to take some of that power back so we can control not only our body, but our mental side as well. Ari, right, you're doing it on the college side. Brian just talked about the pro side. What are you seeing among college athletes? Well, certainly it's wonderful that this, this conversation is even happening. I think the narrative is, is changing on all levels for all athletes. I think specifically for student athletes, um, 
coming off of two years of the pandemic, I think is sort of the biggest area that I'm working through right now and that we're sort of processing of all of the changes that happened in the last two years for student athletes around seasons getting cut off, being sent home um, in the spring of 2020 in the middle of a season, eligibility questions, anxieties that come with um, long breaks from playing or being removed socially from their teammates, uh, from, from coaches. Um, so I think the pandemic certainly has raised anxiety levels and has increased uh, social isolation. And now student athletes are readjusting to being back with teams and back in competitive spaces. And uh, that's been challenging. And I think certainly um, having uh, professionals, having avenues to talk this through and get support is essential for student athletes. There were already plenty of pressures that student athletes were under uh, from all, all angles to, uh, to perform, to be at a certain level um, at a very consistent rate. Now they're doing it um, as we've all sort of been challenged with our lives over the last two years with this unexpected uncertainty they've been living with, which I think I've seen a, an uptick in anxiety and um, just a, a lot of challenge around reintegrating into sport. Dr. Alpha, you keep nodding your head. This sounds very familiar to you, correct? Yeah, I am listening to my colleagues and all of the things that they're naming that are specific to either being a college student athlete or a professional athlete. And I'm also thinking about for our young people, uh, everything that they bring with them outside of that, that impacts their mental health. So you have a lot of young people who are coming into college. I have a friend who runs a, he's not a good friend, but he's a great guy. His name is Humble. And he runs a sports agency out in LA. And he said something to me, it was a couple months ago, where for some of these uh, young people, I hesitate to say men and women because we have non-gender conforming folks and transgender folks who perform um, in college athletics as well. They're carrying the weight of their family's expectations because some of them already coming into college are set up as the breadwinners for the family. And all the family is looking for them to do great things, right? So they can help lift everybody up, right? Maybe not necessarily out of poverty, but they can elevate the whole family. And I can't imagine having that kind of pressure on me um, and, try, and still having to perform. I also think about, we talk about the context of the pandemic and within the pandemic, we've had a lot of conversations around racial and social justice. So I think about young people of color who have watched some of these things unfold on television and, and heard about these things and seen these things in their communities and had disproportionate impacts of COVID in their communities. Um, and within the context of having to perform, you're also carrying all of that. And so I agree with my colleague, Mr. Westbrook, with this idea of it's wonderful that we're now in a place where young people feel empowered to talk about it. But I also don't want to lose the recognition and importance of acknowledging all the people who fought for us to be in a place for them to be able to have that space to talk about these things right now, right? So I think about not necessarily athletes, but people like Mary J. Blige, who like 15 years ago was talking about being suicidal. And as a black woman to say that, what she did was sort of set the stage for the Naomi Osaka's of today and Simone Biles to be able to say publicly, you know, I don't want to do this because I'm not in the right headspace. So you know, I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm just thinking about, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be a college student in this day and age and the kind of additional pressures that our young people deal with. So that was what a lot of the nodding was about, just acknowledging and thinking about all the additional layers that our young folks are carrying with them nowadays. And Sharon, you, you do a lot with workplace issues in this space. Tell us about that. Sure, I mean, I think that the parallels between people with mental health challenges in the workplace and student athletes and professional athletes dealing with mental health challenges in the sports context, there are a lot of parallels. I mean, I've been doing disability rights work for 30 years now. Um, and when I first started, you know, HIV AIDS and any sort of mental illness, those were the two most stigmatized disabilities by far. People did not acknowledge that they were struggling with mental health challenges, be it depression, be it anxiety, be it OCD. You could go on and on. And over the past 30 years, I think you're right, we have seen a total shift 
in terms of people feeling comfortable talking about what they are dealing with. You know, there's a concept in the disability community called disability pride, right? Similar to gay pride, where people are talking about their whole selves, including their disabilities, and what they need and asking for what they need. Um, so we're seeing that in sports, and I think that permeates to the workplace. It permeates to the educational setting generally. If you have public persona who can come out and talk about what they're dealing with, that will inspire other students and other people in the workplace to say, you know, I'm struggling with this too, and I need these supports also. So I think sports plays a really important role, not only for the athletes, but basically everyone in society right now. Danny? Yeah, so this is um, a question kind of for everyone. Um, what are ways that we think our colleges or even professional teams um, you know, can be doing for our athletes to prepare them um, you know, for a transition outside of sports and maybe some of the identity issues that come with being valued for such a long time on just what you do on the field. Because um, again, athletes are you know, a full person and they have all these other traits to them as Dr. Alfie has pointed out. Um, so how can we better prepare for our athletes for some of those identity challenges they may face? You know, the first thing is how you start is you start having the conversation. And if you don't have the conversation, which again, back in the day, the conversation was pushed to the back because we didn't want to acknowledge some of these issues because you don't want to have to deal with them. And you don't want to have to deal with them because at some point you say that player or that person may not be available to go make money, which is playing on the field. And so acknowledging it, number one, is the biggest issue. I'll never forget, this might have been my first or second year in the NFL. And so we had this guy, we have the training room, so we have tables all around. And it was just this guy just kind of walking around and kind of talking to people, but just like, I didn't even know who he was. And so I asked one of my friends, I'm like, who, who's, this, who's this guy walking around? Oh, he's like, he's the crazy doctor. So you, he was, he's actually a sports psychologist. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's like, he's a, he's a crazy doctor. So if you're crazy, you go talk to him. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll never, so I literally never, throughout my nine years in the NFL, I never talked to him. But the reality is, if you have these conversations about how to better yourself, you have these conversations about mental health, how to change things, then athletes will start thinking, at least you'll start looking within like, hey, am I having this issue? Am I having these problems? I think back to some of the athletes that, that, and I say it all the time, you never know what someone else is going through. And there are so many guys, one of my great friends, Brian Dawkins, and I, I, we played together for eight years. I never knew that he struggled with mental illness. I never knew that. I'm so one of the best players in Philadelphia Eagles history in the NFL history, and I never knew that. And I was his best friend on the team. And that's how hidden things were. That's how, that's how you know, people kept things uh, inside of them because they didn't want it out. And if you let it out in a sport, especially like football, really almost all sports, then you're the weak link. And the last thing that you want to do is be the weak link. So you, you have to begin the conversation somewhere. You also have to give these, these, these men, these, these young people um, and women as well, the opportunity to express themselves. So you have to give them time, which, which comes back to the coach side. The coaches have responsibilities too. The responsibility should be, I want the healthiest, physically and mentally uh, healthiest player on the field for me at all times. In order to do that, I may have to give up some of my time as a coach on the field to make sure that they're getting the mental health, the physical health that they can possibly, that, that they can, the best they can possibly get. And unfortunately, these coaches generally don't want to give up their time to make sure that their, their kids or their, their adults are, are better. And that, that shouldn't happen anymore. Sorry. Well, that example that you gave is sort of where uh, this conversation has gone over the last decade or so around changing the overall feeling and destigmatizing mental health and mental performance services. I think panels like this, uh, high profile athletes being open and honest about their challenges that they've gone through have ch has totally changed the playing field for access and understanding of what these services can look like for a student athlete or for a professional athlete. And that, uh, working with a mental health professional, talking about the mental side of sports is actually can be a competitive advantage or can help you sustain your career or can help you process transitions like back from injury or the end of career or the beginning of a career. So it's essentially um, 
entirely changing how we look at these types of support systems and that they are just one piece of the puzzle. So you work with your strength and conditioning staff, you work with your athletic training staff, and then you work with a mental health or mental performance professional because that is just one element of your overall sustainability and health as an athlete. It is drastically changing from the we'll only talk to that person if, you're, if something really bad is going on. It's now a, a part of the, the full uh, sort of holistic approach to supporting athletes. Um, Go ahead, Sharon. Sure. So the Department of Labor just um, launched a whole campaign about mental health in the workplace, and they have this rubric of the four A's. And when I think about what can schools do and what can sports organizations do, I think it just provides a really nice framework. So they talk about awareness, just what we've been talking about. You know, what are mental health issues? Mental health itself is a spectrum. Just because you need mental Mental health support doesn't necessarily mean you have a mental illness, but it may help to talk with someone. There may be resources. Um, so there's awareness. There are accommodations, and we can go into the whole legal analysis, but is a person entitled to a reasonable accommodation, such as not having to talk to the media, or not necessarily like Royce White having to fly to a game, but can drive to a game instead? What are those accommodations that will allow the athlete to compete at their highest level? You know, they talk about assistance. So again, what are those resources? Putting people in touch with the resources they need, be it a training, be it a hotline. And then finally, access, access to mental health treatment, because a lot of students don't have that right now. A lot of professional um, athletes don't have that right now. How do you give, hook people up with the mental health providers that can provide the support they need? Dr. Alfie, you mentioned the big names, Osaka and um, Simone Biles, so much in the public. There was support out there, but as you know, some of it was not supportive. Some of it was like, how could they do this? You know, what, they can't talk to the media for 10 minutes? or Simone Biles has been doing this since age three and she can't finish a performance. So, yes, we are destigmatizing everything, but there is still that, how do we change that? How do we change that perception? There's a lot of it, and so I think it's the idea that we empower people with the tools and we provide wraparound for people so that when they do speak out publicly, they feel they have support. The two people that you named were already at the top of their game. Right. So I think there's a little bit more buffer for folks like that if they decide they want to come out. I mean, if Naomi Osaka, given as much money as she made last year, if she decides to sit out, financially, that's not necessarily going to be that difficult for her, right? For Simone Biles, what else can the woman do? I mean, I mean, she literally has done everything you can do in that sport. And so when you're at that level, as my colleagues were talking, I was just processing that a little bit. It's not easy, but they have a little bit more cushion. I think our job is how do we empower young people and not so young people to know that if they decide they want to come out and speak about it, what kind of supports will they have? So for me, some of those supports have to do with do we have a clear understanding in our field about how different racial, cultural, ethnic groups conceptualize mental illness? Everybody don't look at it the same way, right? In many communities of color, people don't think about these things as biological, right? So we have all these solutions. Okay, give them a pill. You'd be hard pressed to get many people in communities of color to take a pill because we don't, many of us, not all, it's not a blanket statement, do not conceptualize mental illness in that way. We conceptualize it often as a weakness or a failing, right? So blacks and Latinx communities, you just need to pray a little harder. You pray harder, God will fix it. And I think if we're not able to hold those concepts and share with people things like what I call, what we all call cultural competence, which I have to say is not, you know, every single solitary thing about every single solitary culture. That's not what cultural competence is. It is a way of approaching and creating a welcoming space for any patient or person who comes and sits in front of you. That's cultural competence. So I think if we can infuse those kinds of ideas into the conversation so that people, I always talk about people need to feel seen, they need to feel heard, and to stay out of ableist language, they need to feel valued. 
If we can make people feel like that, I think that creates the circumstances to allow people to feel like maybe I can lean on this person to share a little bit with them. So I'll say quickly, my brother played uh, college football and this was, he's a little bit older than you. So it was 25 years ago, maybe. Um, And, you know, I think had he had someone, not that he necessarily had any issues, I'm just thinking about like his team and where he played. He went to an HBCU, so it was a whole different context. But if you have the right people in place in those settings, someone who looks like, thinks like, talks like, can relate to, then I think it makes it a little bit easier for people to feel like here is a place I can go. Because access is not just about money. What hours is the place open? Do they come to you or do you go to them? Access is also about what am I going to get when I show up? Is this person going to understand me? Are they going to understand, or are they going to be able to relate to me? Am I going to have to explain my whole life story to them? Um, and so I think if we can create those kinds of, it's like a, it's like a, a perfect stew. If you create the right stew, the people will come. And I think some of our struggle is we don't have all the ingredients. We have pieces. And we don't allow people to show up as what we talk about in my nonprofit is their full, authentic, and unapologetic selves. If we can create spaces for that, I think that can ease just a tiny bit of the burden and reduce some of the stigma so people will feel like they can come out and talk and speak about these issues without having to have the buffer of being rich and famous and successful in their sport. Question I have is it's sports is such a cutthroat business. As Brian knows, even being one of the best players, and as Scott and I talked about, this so many players for so few jobs. So again, giving a, te- a team a reason to go to another player, I guess how do we get past that? You know, how do we get past, the, oh, I can't tell them about my, you know, my issues, I'll lose my, you know, I'll be benched, I won't get to play. Have you dealt with that? And how, how do we break that barrier? Well, I think it starts from a leadership perspective in that within the college athletic space, having athletic directors, coaches, uh, assistant coaches understand the landscape and be educated on what meant the mental health spectrum that was mentioned before and that I think there's so many incorrect messages around mental health and around what um, that really means that it's an educational piece first and foremost, right, for coaches, for administrators to understand the plight of a student athlete, what an 18 to 23 year old is going through right now. Um, On top of that, I think it's having um, the ease of access for student athletes and allowing them sort of to organically discuss how that work benefits them. Where it's, it's a slow burn a little bit and it takes some time and this is the second university. I started a program at the University of Vermont back in 2017 and now I'm doing the same thing at Johns Hopkins. And one of the things that we've seen is by embedding mental health professionals and and limiting the barriers to entry, the narrative around mental health and mental performance slowly changes. So we're talking about it differently. We're articulating the value of it differently. And I think over a long enough timeline, um, with buy-in from coaches and from leaders, it starts to slowly move away from the idea that, well, I'm not fit to compete. I'm not fit to be in this competitive space. You can simultaneously be working on your mental health, have challenges, and compete at a high level at the same time. And I think the more that we talk about it like that and we sort of um, allow people to bring sort of those feelings and those thoughts to the surface, um, big picture, that will that stigma will slowly dissipate. I think it's also just seeing what happens. So if someone does come forward and talk about their mental illness, are they kicked off the team? Are they supported? With each person that comes forward and is not, doesn't suffer harmful consequences, that will make the next person feel safe. So back to the role of the coach, creating an environment where people feel psychologically safe, where they feel like they can speak up, where if they do speak up, they are supported, that's gonna make the difference. And it's not an overnight process. It's going to be slow, it's going to be incremental change. But given what we're dealing with right now, where we're having so many athletes committing suicide, suffering from depression, suffering from anxiety, we need to create that culture and there needs to be support all across the board. You know, what's been interesting here, we've kind of seen it here in Philadelphia, and I still think we haven't crossed that line yet. 
Lane Johnson and uh, Brandon Brooks. Two of the biggest guys you'll ever know. Like, literally biggest guys. Lane is huge. And both of them set out a bunch of games because they weren't mentally prepared to play. And here's the problem. They're starters. They're Pro Bowl players. They're all pro type of guys. What if you're the 53rd guy on, the, on that roster? What happens to that guy? That, that's the question that really we haven't that, 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 that we haven't crossed that bridge yet. If you're that last guy on the roster where you're teeter-tottering, whether the coaches like you or not, well, you get that same opportunity. And we have to get to a space. I, I'll never forget it. I was talking to Andy Reid just about philosophy. He said, listen, I get on the guys all day, all day long, every single day throughout the week. But on Sundays, I don't say anything to the guys because I want the guys to be free. And I've been in a space before where, you know, your, your coaches are talking to you, and I don't want the guys' mind to be jumbled up. Until we have coaches that understand, to your point, what mental illness is and, and, and just mental fatigue is, and they are able to put that on their players and allow, allow to understand what those players are going through, then at some point we may never get to the point where we need to be at. The coaches, the, the general managers, the owners, they all have to own part of this. And if they don't, then it can never trickle down to the, to the, the position coaches, the trainers, and other players on the team. So it starts at the top, and of course it trickles down. Um, throughout that process. Dr. Alfie, I see you nodding. I guess I'm just struggling with this idea of, you know, what my colleague here has just said. If you are the at the bottom of the food chain and you're struggling, where is your help? And so I start to think about what are some of the potential strategies and solutions. And some of it is the, I hate to say psychoeducation because I don't want people to sound like they're ignorant, but it's raising awareness, right? We have to help people understand what is that continuum. Everybody is somewhere on that continuum. So we might be looking at that third string running back or quarterback or whatever the case may be. My brother played linebacker, so let me say third string linebacker, although he was a starter. Um, and if you are that third string person or you're the person who's trying to get onto the team or, you know, God forbid you want to be a walk-on in college and you're trying to get there, you're fighting to get there, where are the opportunities for things like prevention? Right? Where do we start to talk to people about here are signs and symptoms? And so if you start feeling these things and it lasts for this period of time, you should talk to somebody. Or where are the alternatives to going to see a mental health professional? Because again, I come back to this idea. Different cultural groups don't enter into the immediate ideas. Let me go talk to the psychologist, the clinical social worker, or the psychiatrist. They may never get there. So what are the other opportunities? So I have a, he's not a close friend, but he's a, a good friend, Ryan Monday, who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He has this whole new app and platform called Alchemy Health. And Alchemy Health is all about mindfulness meditation and sound baths and things like that. And so how do you provide those kind of tools and resources to young people so that you can help teach them how to self-regulate and manage before these things get out of control? And I think if we can even do those kinds of things, no, it's not going to help the person who is in the throes of suicidal ideation in the moment, but it certainly can help the one where maybe there's a family history, they, they can start asking around in the family. You know, I, you remember Uncle Joe. I remember some stuff was going on with him. What happened to Uncle Joe? And they can be aware themselves so that when these things start creeping up, it doesn't catch them off guard. And I think that's often what happens to young people. They start feeling this stuff and they don't manage it or they don't know what to do with it. They keep trying to play through. You know, we always talk about powering through stuff, right? I used to hear that. Oh, my dad was a coach. I used to hear all the time, you used to power through it. And we have to stop telling young people that. We have to give them some tools to help them manage it so they're not feeling compelled to power through. And I think those kinds of other alternate forms of care, that's why I'm sitting here nodding my head, because everything is not you either don't go and you suffer or you go see the mental health professional. There's a whole lot of stuff in between that we never talk about. And that's what I was just kind of nodding my head about. So we've spoken a little bit about, um, you know, raising awareness and having conversations. Um, but, you know, when you do have these athletes who do come out and share their stories, how do we help them deal with some of the feedback and criticism they'll get on social media over that? Because, um, you know, Simone Biles, unfortunately, for as many supporters as she had when she spoke out, she also had a million people saying, you're a quitter, you let your team down, um, things like that. So how do you support athletes through sharing their stories or maybe even if it's just, you know, on the small team level, how do you support them? 
Don't read the comments. <laughs> don't read the comments. There's a button called mute and restrict. And, you know, blocking is your friend, right? So you, I'm quick to block people. And so I think there's this, especially for, I would say, Gen Zers in particular, maybe younger millennials and Gen Zers, there's this idea that the work, everything exists exists because of social media, or my whole world is in social media, right? It's not IRL. I think that's what people say. I don't know. <laughs> it's in social media, right? And so I think is there a part of it is us teaching and sharing the message that we have to have some restraint. So I believe I went on my first social media break ever last week, and it was supposed to last a week. I think it's going to last a month because it was such a relief just to not be bothered with any of it, checking likes and checking views. And, like, I was just so happy to not have to deal with it. And so I think there are healthy ways to use social media. And one of the things I really like is in the Big East, uh, every year they do a mental health training with the uh, male and female basketball players. And one of the things they talk about is social media management. How do you respond to people when you see that stuff? And I don't know why people don't do that everywhere. That like should be something that all athletes, all young people should get that, all older people too. So I think part of it is teaching people behaviors and have, having them practice behaviors so that they understand there is something that you can do, right? I had to have somebody tell me you can put people on mute. I knew how to block, that was easy. But I think if we can start there and teach people, my daughter taught me something, she's here with me. She taught me about this idea of taking all the apps off your phone for a period of time. I was, I mean, of course you can do it, but you never think about doing things like that. And so at the age of 16, 17, she just took it off her phone for a year. Um, and I think if we can teach people, little, maybe not that drastic, but little things like that, you've got to, I feel like it's not enough to say just stay off social media. It's not enough to just say don't read the comments. You have to give people the tools for how to do it. And I think those are some of the ways that I try to share with people and that I try to follow myself for managing that. But it's not easy. Yeah, Ari, you must see the, the impact of social media directly with your clientele. Absolutely, and this is a, a, a pretty common conversation that I have in my individual sessions, in my team sessions, in groups, or even as I consult with coaching staffs around the changing landscape with social media and how it influences student athletes. I think, um, unfortunately, there, with a space that is so uncontrolled and there's so much information funneling in and out of it, you are um, going to come into contact with things that are uh, difficult for you to see about yourself or that raise your anxiety level and put you into a very sort of ego-involved mindset where you're 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 deriving your sense of self-worth through your comparison to others. And I use that sort of as a, a jumping off point for a lot of my individual work with student athletes around understanding your motivations. What's intrinsic? What's extrinsic? How can you define your motivators and come from a more task-involved mindset where you are focusing on what you, on what you can control and being um, aware of the emotional response that comes from checking Instagram and seeing um, the number of likes, positive or negative, right? I think it, it raises, uh, there's plenty of conversations to be had around um, how that affects us emotionally in both directions. So um, in terms of, of your question around sort of the um, exposing openly what you've gone through. I always try to support student athletes if that's something that they want to do and help them articulate and effectively communicate that message, whether it be just to their team, just to their coaches, or if they want to do it publicly and then work with them on whatever the, the challenges are and give them an, a safe and, and open space to talk through um, how it feels to be that, that vulnerable. And I think the more that we can promote vulnerability, even if some of the aftermath of it is challenging, we're going to give people a chance to be their, their true selves more often than not, and I think that's, that's a good step in the right direction. I think the, you know, the, Brian, I'm sort of reminded of we've had these same conversations six, seven, eight, ten years ago about another topic, concussions. Like no one wanted to come forth with concussions, and there were the silent injury. You don't see people limping around on the field. They're, they're silent. And, t and players, you know, bombing their baseline test in order to be able to play. Or, and we've progressed on that. And concussion awareness is way past that. And, and people are reporting concussions and staying out longer. And no repercussions and no stigmas. So maybe that's a guide. You know, maybe that's a guide to where mental health goes. I, I sure hope so. Um, it, 
it's unfortunate that it has happened this way, but I think this is just the way that the sports world has happened. When the stars of our sports start going through things like mental illness, concussions, that's when the whole sports landscape takes notice. And unfortunately, we live in a society that says, well, you're suffering from that, and since I don't suffer from that, I'm judging you, and I'm looking down upon you, and, you know, I'm raising three kids, and, you know, my oldest is eight, five, and three, so my eight-year-old, she thinks that the world that you're talking about, social media, that's, that's a real world, and that's, this is what, and, and so it's my job as her dad to teach her that's part of the world, that's not the real world, though, and let me explain it to you, and I think as we continue to raise these children, as to uh, try to help these young athletes and older athletes, we got to explain that to them too. And part of that is saying, you're right, unplug from social media, unplug from p other people's uh, opinion. At some point, you know, I, I was, again, I played a while ago now, which is weird to say, but I didn't really care about anyone's opinion because I knew, uh, just, I'll give you an example. We had, in Philadelphia, we used to have writers that used to, get after the coaches, get after the players. It was, it was dog eat dog. Les, Les Bowen used to come here. I, I hated Les because he would always talk. I felt like he was trying to separate the team from the players. And at some point, you build this callus that says, I don't really care what that person says, but this is what I do know. I do know how I play because I can watch the film, and I'm the one playing. And so he can't tell me something about myself or my game that I don't already know. Our children and our, 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 our young adults need to understand that too. You can't tell me who I am. I know who I am. There's a self-awareness issue that our kids need to continue to build upon, and that, that's work. The kids have to put in the work. The parents have to guide them through that work. Um, and sometimes that's hard to do because we're guiding them through a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I, I'm thinking about my kids now. I'm guiding them through a whole bunch of stuff, a lot of stuff that I didn't have to worry about that they're trying to figure out right now in their world. And this is an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a three-year-old, and you got a 42-year-old dad like, I don't even know how to do the damn third-grade math, and I, I can't help you with anything else. And so it's a, um, it's a struggle, and it's, but it's part of life, and that's what I think as we continue to get better, all of us continue to get better, I think we'll, we'll have better children and better society because of it. Dr. Alfie, what, what did you do with I keep lady? hesitating because I, like, I feel like I easily... You know, y'all can tell I don't like to talk, <laughs> but I could easily just like and just take over the whole conversation. So I'm just trying to pace myself and be good and behave. And as you're talking, what I'm thinking about, sometimes it's hard for parents and caregivers to do that guidance work for our kids because they haven't done it for themselves. Right. And so you think about I'm Gen X. And so we think about Gen Xers and older. These were definitely not conversations that we had. So how do we have these conversations with our kids when we haven't had the conversations? So I think some of it is building the capacity to pardon the phrase, teach old dog new tricks. So how do we build the capacity for folks who've never been taught about these things or never been made to feel that these conversations are okay? So I can give you one example about how the conversations aren't okay and the messages that I think Gen Xers and older people get. And those conversations are, we did a study a long time ago, it was probably like 30 years ago, and this woman said, in response to a question about why is there so much stigma around mental health in the black community, she said, I'm already black, I'm already a woman, I don't also need to be crazy. And I think that's people's attitude. When you, the more identities you layer onto a person, the more people feel pushed out to the margins. And I'm always talking about what can we do to bring people back to the center? And part of it is I've heard everybody say up here, normalizing the conversation. And how do we normalize the conversation? By watching some of these, like you said, when the big stars, when it impacts them, then it feels a little bit safer for the rest of us. But in the interim, it also is demonstrating, like you all have also said, from the president down to, you know, we used to call them environmental services when I was on faculty at Duke, that everybody has to be made to feel that, you know how they say, it's okay to not be okay. And we have to put our money where our mouth is in terms of making sure that people have culturally relevant, culturally competent diverse sources to go to when they need the help. It can't be that we have one team psychologist, one performance professional, and you got a team that's very diverse, and that person ain't diverse, because they're not going. 
And so I think if, if we really want these things to change, it is doing what you know all these amazing students and faculty and staff and you as the director have done here today is allowing us to have these conversations. Because somebody will walk out of here thinking, oh, okay, so she said something about diversify the staff. All right, we need to go recruit. Right, or somebody else will say, they heard this gentleman say, you know, give the, the athletes, I was gonna say men, that's loaded. We'll give the athletes an opportunity to be with each other and teach them how to have peer-led conversations about mental health. Because they'll listen to each other, right? We don't need to be in the room all the time. So I think it's little things like that. Um, if we can do those kinds of things on a regular basis, the final thing I have to say is this, we have to fund this stuff. We gotta find money to give these kids opportunities to have these, right? And so simple things like having a budget. I have a girlfriend who uh, is the senior, I don't know what her title is, but she's like the senior mental health lead at Temple. And they have a budget where they can provide food and stuff for the young people to sit and have the conversation, right? Or they can create this, offer the space. They have these sleep pods. It's the coolest thing, these chairs that look like an egg and you can go sit in the pod and chill out and block out all the noise. When you create that kind of environment, what you're telling people is your physical space is set up for you to know that we care about your mental health. And if we don't do those kinds of little things, I think it's harder to sell the message that we care about our student athletes and our young people's mental health. So those are things I was sitting and thinking about. Can I add one other point? Because we're sitting here in this beautiful law school. Um, we can't forget the role of law, in particular the Americans with Disabilities Act. In terms of how do you change things, there is attitude, there is culture. But the law has played a role also, where athletes now are standing up for their rights. They're asserting their rights also under both Section 504 and the ADA. Uh, we're talking confidentiality. We're talking the right to accommodations. You know, I, for those of you who might remember the Casey Martin case, where was it a fundamental alteration to use a golf cart um, in the PGA tournament? and the court ruled no, it wasn't, that was premised on the ADA. That was an athlete standing up for his rights, taking on a big organization, and saying, you know, the law supports me. And so I think another resource in terms of education is also about what are athletes' legal rights. And I think with this focus on mental health, we're probably going to see more in the legal sphere start to um, develop with respect to mental health. You know, I, I think that's so important because I, I'll give you one quick example. There's this ride share deal for the uh, NFL. I'm sure the NBA has it too. So let's say the players are out on Tuesday night, they're drinking, um, they can call this number, app or whatever it is, and they can get a ride home for free, no problem. Now the issue is that none of the players use it because they feel like the management team, would find yeah, out the about team would be like oh shit he's out on uh, Tuesday night every Tuesday night he's out drinking so none of the players use it right okay. and that's almost the same thing with the mental health side the, the players don't want to use some of the things that they have in house to help them because they they're feeling like well I know at contract time the first thing they're going to bring up is well you know you have this mental health issue. Or you know you have this drinking issue out every Tuesday night and you need this ride home. And there, that's a huge fear for athletes where you have a 10-year window to make as much money as you possibly can. That's a huge fear. Once again, time has flown. <laughs> We're out of time. Sharon Massling, Ari Miller, Brian Westbrook, Dr. Alfie, and my co-host Danny, thank you so much. <laughs>